I found that Booker T. Washington had visited Mississippi in 1908 and Charles Banks coordinated his tour through the state. And so I decided to look at other tours that Washington had taken, uh, despite the fact that one of the leading historians on Booker T. Washington, a man by the name of Lewis Harlan, in his uh, magnum opus on Booker T. Washington, he stated that to see one of Washington's tours was basically to see them all. And so as I started to explore uh, different tours that Washington took throughout the South, I decided that it was a larger story that needed to be told. Washington had the occasion to visit Florida in 1912. And uh, when he visited Florida, he traveled through a number of cities in the state of Florida. He started out in the western part of the state in Pensacola. Uh, he would make a whistle stop from the back of his rail car in Quincy, Florida, coming eastward. Uh, he came on to Tallahassee, and when he stopped in Tallahassee, he actually spoke at what was called Florida and m College now. Uh, and when he was here, we actually have the podium that he used when he delivered his speech. Educational tours can be a little bit misleading because they were not educational in the terms of book learning, but Washington was actually traveling around to educate himself, but more importantly others, about the progress of the black race. And one of the things that's important in terms of understanding the context for that particular time period was that this was a very brutal time in uh, the American experience for African Americans uh, coming out of Reconstruction. So there were a number of efforts afoot to portray African Americans as being subhuman. Uh, there were arguments that the black race would not survive in the absence of slavery. Uh, people argued that the black race was degenerating, dying off, uh, in fact, in the absence of slavery. And so Washington realized that in terms of trying to counter that particular argument, he could utilize these tours throughout the South to show that black people were actually progressing. And so what we find taking place is that on the literary field of battle, you have a number of authors who are writing books that are short biographical sketches of African Americans and their accomplishments since slavery. People who were born into slavery, but the tremendous things that they were doing uh, at that time. So you had a, just a genre uh, of, of works that were produced along that line. And so what Washington is actually doing when he travels throughout the South is that he's actually placing black progress on display. Some people were writing about it. He had the capacity to show actually what African Americans were doing. So when he staged these events, he actually traveled with black lawyers, black doctors, black professors, black ministers, uh, black Masonic leaders, black businessmen, black undertakers, those people who were part of the talented 10th a black America actually traveled with Booker T. Washington. And when he would travel to different states, he was also accompanied by the leading African American doctors, lawyers, and business people, et cetera, uh, throughout each state. And so by having those people to actually dress a certain kind of way professionally, uh, to have those people who, who could articulate themselves in a certain kind of way, uh, to have those people who could tell their stories about how they were able to come up from slavery as well, and, and, and to actually demonstrate black progress went a long way for Booker T. Washington in undermining white supremacist arguments that the black race was dying off and regressing in the absence of slavery. And this was very, very prevalent. Uh, for example, one of the things that uh, occurred during Washington's uh, lifetime, actually in 1906, there was an African from the Congo who was brought to the United States by the name of Ota Binga. And when Ota Bingo was brought here, he was brought to the United States to participate in the St. Louis World's Fair at that particular time. After the fair was over, the people who were uh, coordinators of the fair tried to, started to decide, or tried to decide at least what they were going to do with Ota Binga. And so they made the decision to place him in the Bronx Zoo up in New York in a cage with the orangutans. And some people made the argument that uh, Ota Binga was the missing link in between humans and apes. And, uh, you know, he came from a particular tribe where his teeth were shaved, and so people put bones in the cages to make it seem like he was accountable and so forth. And this man had a family back home. Uh, he was taken away from his family, and this is in 1906. And so you had this type of scenario taking place where Washington and other African Americans saw the need to try to counter those negative images. Uh, we see the proliferation of, of black memorabilia. 
uh, in the late 1800s because when African Americans could no longer be bought and sold physically, you see the emergence of this material culture. So you have the sambos and the mammies that are sold, uh, the postcards that are sold uh, throughout the South with exaggerated features of African Americans. Uh, African Americans appearing on different food items in the United States in a very demeaning fashion. And so all of these things that are taking place in the country, Washington and the people who supported him, we call them Bookerites, uh, realized that by placing black progress on display, they were able to undermine uh, those particular assertions with substance. When Booker T. Washington traveled around, he wanted to make sure that all of the venues consisted of not just African Americans, but white Americans as well. And so usually, leading white figures in the communities would participate on the programs. They would either introduce Washington, they would welcome Washington to their particular city. In some instances, you even had whites who raised money to bring Washington uh, to their particular towns as he traveled throughout uh, the South. And this was very important because it sent a message to whites in the North and in the South, as well as African Americans, that Booker T. Washington was the leading uh, African American spokesman at that particular time, but it also provided a sense of hope to African Americans who were able to look at these uh, panels, uh, the, the, uh, the platforms where the different people were having the discussions and the programs were taking place to see that maybe a better day is in fact coming. Um, interestingly, um, the, at all of the events, whites attended the events, they were not just on the program. In some instances, it was a 50-50 split between black and whites in the audience. They were always segregated. And it was important for the newspapers to convey that information so people would not be alarmed and become distracted by people sitting together as opposed to the message that Booker T. Washington was trying to actually convey. And so one story when he actually traveled through North Carolina, it just so happened that the Vice President of the United States uh, a man by the name of James Schoolcraft Sherman was in North Carolina at the same time. And he requested to meet with Booker T. Washington. So there is actually an incident where their rail cars back up to each other and they come out to the back of the rail cars and shake hands with each other. And there's just this vociferous applause that takes place, right? And both of them laughed about the fact that uh, Sherman uh, told Washington that he could see that he was in the South converting centers as well. And so they both laughed about that. And actually Sherman participated on one of the programs afterwards with Booker T. Washington. So Washington was really like a modern day politician on the campaign trail. And one of the major issues for middle class African Americans in particular was Jim Crow travel. You know, African Americans resented the fact that if they had money to pay for first class accommodations in terms of travel, that they were forced into the smoking cars or given substandard accommodations. So the way Washington and the other leading men he had traveling with him were able to get around that was that they typically rented their own private sleeper and Pullman cars. And so they were able to show that by having some kind of economic access and wealth, it was a way of circumventing the Jim Crow system. Washington certainly uh, was a child of the South and there were some people who did, he recognized did not want him to visit their, their towns uh, or their cities or states. Uh, one poignant example of that occurred when Washington was scheduling his tour of Mississippi. And the governor of Mississippi at the time was one of the most uh, racist um, um, ideologues uh, in the country at that particular time, a man by the name of James K. Vardaman. And Vardaman had all types of things that say derogatory things about African-American people. But Washington became so concerned about the threats against his life that he actually hired a Pinkerton detective to go down and scout out Mississippi before he visited the state. And so this particular detective went ahead of Washington and his party. Washington received a letter from a young man by the name of uh, J. Matoni, and he begged Booker T. Washington not to visit Mississippi, he said, because the people are saying, if you come here, you are leaving a body bag and you would not leave the way that you came. And so Washington even received bomb threats. People sent letters saying that if you 
If you come to Jackson, Mississippi, we're going to blow up the rail car that you're on. And so um, he had concerns about that as evidenced by the fact that he hired this detective. But when the detective went down and scouted out the area, he said he didn't find any particular uh, individuals who, who had uh, animus or plan to assassinate Booker T. Washington, but the threat was always there. Now, interestingly, when uh, Washington spoke in Jackson, um, there were so many people there that the upper level of the auditorium where he spoke, the balcony collapsed at the end of his speech. And so they wondered if it was some type of sabotage that had taken place, but they determined that it was no act of sabotage that caused that to occur. It was just uh, fortuitous that it did. Booker T. Washington was the only African-American leader that had the influence that he manifested uh, during his lifetime. Washington had the support of the Talented Tenth, even though it's not often portrayed that way, uh, but the leading educated um, African-Americans in the country at that particular time, most of them supported Booker T. Washington. The Talented Tenth was that upper echelon of black society. Those were the educated African-American people who had gone to college at that particular time, the black professional class at that particular time. And, and, and in many instances, people tend to associate them more with W.E.B. Du Bois because he graduated from Harvard uh, and William Monroe Trotter, he graduated from Harvard as well. But the reality is that the people who were traveling with Washington, like Alain Leroy Locke, who was an English professor at Howard University, he was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard University. Uh, James Napier, who graduated from Oberlin and Howard University Law School, was the register of the U.S. Treasury. Uh, John A. Kinney uh, created a hospital uh, in, in Tuskegee, Alabama. He was a physician. Uh, Charles Banks is the leading banker in Mississippi. There were 13 black banks in Mississippi, and Charles Banks was the leading banker and the leading businessman in that particular state at that particular time. And so what we see is that really um, the individuals who, who typically would be associated with the Talented Tenth are supporters of Booker T. Washington and his message as well. Washington established Tuskegee Institute, which became the best funded institution, African-American institution of that day, but also one of the best in the South. So the student population at Tuskegee was the same size as the student populations at Auburn University and the University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa. It was also one of the best funded um, black institutions of that day and Washington hired, he used to boast about the fact that he hired the largest number of black college graduates in the country. Washington also founded the National Negro Business League, which put him in contact with black business people throughout the country. The Tuskegee Farmers Conference, he founded that particular organization. And so he had his hands on a lot of different things at that particular time. He also had influence with uh, presidents uh, at that particular point. So President Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, in many instances, they would go to Booker T. Washington for his recommendation on whether or not individuals, black and white, should receive federal appointments. So there are instances of where you know, Roosevelt was going to Washington to make sure that a white person was okay and palatable to him before they received an appointment as a judge or a postmaster or what have you throughout the South. So he had tremendous political influence during that particular uh, era as well. Uh, he also had influence with journalists. Um, we know that he even went so far as to uh, finance some black newspapers so he could control the message that was sent out. And based on some recent scholarship uh, on Washington, we know that he was very much in control of how his image was projected uh, as well. And so looking at all of those things and considering the fact that he had a following, if you look at how the people came out to listen to him speak, but not only did they listen to him speak, they believed in his philosophy and they tried to carry into practice those things that, actually, that Booker T. Washington spoke about and encouraged them to do. And so there are instances that we see, for example, when he came to Florida and spoke in Ocala, Florida, that less than a year after that visit, the business people in, in Ocala, African-American business people, they actually opened up a black bank there. 
and certainly it was due to their inspiration of Washington's visit and, and these people were part of the Business League uh, as well. And so what we find is that, you know, other leaders had influence, but the ability to reach so many people and to have so many, many people to actually believe in the message of the person is a little bit different. I think that the, the major point here is that Booker T. Washington was astute enough to call upon different people uh, who believed in his message to help promulgate his view that if he placed black progress on display, it would go a long way towards undermining these arguments about the black race degenerating and dying off in the absence of slavery.